is the ketogenic diet good for our microbiome? To get an understanding here, we have to break down this one question into three individual ones and ask the following. Are ketones actually good for gut health? How does the microbiome change during a ketogenic diet? And what about fiber? I have the timestamps for the questions in the description, so feel free to jump to any section. Also, I will purely focus on scientific research here and will not talk about any anecdote where Lady A or Mr. B got better or worse on a ketogenic diet. So if real science is something you're looking for, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. Okay, without further ado, let's answer the first question. The ketogenic diet is a high-fat diet that leads to the production of ketone bodies that can then be used as an alternative fuel to glucose. The main blood ketone body is beta-hydroxybutyrate and research over the last years has shown that beta-hydroxybutyrate is not purely an energy source but rather acts as a signaling molecule that can activate different pathways in our body that potentially enhance our health. How ketone bodies affect our gut health is not a well-studied area of research yet. However, a paper recently published in the Journal of Cell shows how ketone body signaling mediates intestinal stem cell homeostasis. This wonderful technical paper provides a mechanism on how stem cell renewal, as well as repair of damage in the intestine, is enhanced by ketone bodies. The researchers show that intestinal stem cells produce unusually high levels of ketone bodies, even in the absence of a ketogenic diet. Stem cells can give rise to every other cell, and they are especially important in the intestine as the intestinal lining is replaced after every few days, so there is a huge cell turnover. The researchers also showed in mice that a ketogenic diet helps to repair any intestinal damage. However, this was inhibited by the addition of glucose. Many studies that have been mainly conducted in mice show that the diet high in fat and high in sugar is a recipe for disaster when it comes to our microbiome. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that fat is a culprit here. And another thing we have to consider is that not all fats are created equal. A study fed mice the same micronutrient composition and only interchanged the fat source. They either used safflower oil, milk fat or lard and found that mice consuming the polyunsaturated fatty acid, so the safflower oil, diet exhibit dramatically higher levels of macrophage infiltration relative to milk fat or lard fat mice. Meaning that there was so much more inflammation going on in the mice that consumed the safflower oil. Most people that follow a ketogenic diet are aware of the fact that seed oils are probably not a good idea. I have made a separate video where I explain why you should ban those seed oils from your kit. Anyways, if we want to understand whether a ketogenic diet is good for our microbiome, we should focus mainly on human studies and only on studies that have used a ketogenic diet or a keto-related diet and not diets that are also high in fat. And another thing we have to consider is that the microbiome sometimes needs some time to adapt. This is illustrated in this paper here. People who suffer from multiple sclerosis were placed on a ketogenic diet. And their microbial diversity first dropped quite a bit, but started to recover after 12 weeks and exceeded the baseline value significantly after 23 weeks. Which means that the microbiome sometimes needs a little bit more time to adapt to drastic dietary changes. Another recent study from 2019 looked how a ketogenic diet influenced the microbiome of people with cognitive decline and compared it to a diet that was high in carbohydrates and low in fat. Not surprisingly, there were a lot of changes seen between these two extreme diets. For instance, for both diets, the number of bifidobacterium dropped, but for the ketogenic diet, the number of Akkermansia went up quite a bit. However, it's sometimes hard to deviate whether the changes are good or bad as we do not yet completely understand what makes a healthy microbiome. But what we understand a little bit better is the role of metabolites, so molecules produced by either our microbiome or our cell, on the effects of our health. One big group of metabolites produced by our microbiome are short-chain fatty acids. And this paper found that, for instance, the short-chain fatty acetate was reduced after the ketogenic diet, but the production of the short-chain fatty acid butyrate was increased. Short-chain fatty acids fulfill many functions in our body, 
as they provide on the one hand an energy source to our cells lining the gut, but also on the other hand regulate our immune system. And especially butyrate has been shown to have anti-inflammatory and anti-tumor properties. So in the same paper, the researchers also looked at markers for Alzheimer's as well as markers for bacterial toxins and found that on the ketogenic diet they were both significantly reduced, while on the other hand on the high carb diet they saw an increase in those markers. Okay, we can even go a little bit more extreme here. Researchers asked people to either consume a purely plant-based diet, so a vegan diet, or a purely animal-based diet, so a carnivore diet, and then ask the people to switch their diet after a few days. Interestingly, there was no change in alpha diversity uh, on any of those diets. However, the purely animal-based diet led to a strong increase in beta diversity. Of course, the composition of individual species in the gut changed extremely when switching between these two diets. For instance, on the animal-based diet, there was a huge increase in bile-loving microbes. The researchers also looked at changes in the expression of genes and found that the animal-based diet was associated with an increase in the expression of key genes for vitamin biosynthesis, as well as an increase in the genes necessary for the degradation of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are potentially carcinogenic compounds that can form when meat is cooked at high temperature. And another recent paper from 2019 shows how the microbiome mitigates any potential inflammatory effects from any components in red meat. They show that a molecule that is usually causing an inflammatory response is degraded by enzymes produced by the microbiome and thereby it prevents the incorporation in human tissue. A close relative to the ketogenic diet is the paleo diet. A paleo diet is usually a little bit higher in carbs as well as a little bit higher in protein than a ketogenic diet, but I still think we should look into this here really quick. As a recent paper found that Italians who followed a paleo diet had a higher microbiome diversity compared to Italians who followed a Mediterranean diet. In fact, the paleo people had a surprisingly high microbial diversity, which was comparable or even partially higher to that of traditional hunter-gatherer population, like the Hadza, Matzes or Inuits. For the completeness though, I should mention another paper that found that the paleo diet was associated with an increase in blood TMAO levels. TMAO is a molecule produced by the microbiome after eating choline-rich foods like eggs. There's the idea that TMAO is associated with an increased risk for heart diseases. But I also have to mention that especially fish increases blood TMAO levels and most people agree that fish prevents heart diseases. And also another paper recently published found that choline supplementation actually prevents the development of Alzheimer's. So I would say the TMAO story is not yet closed. Okay, the last study I want to mention in this part of the video is when researchers looked at the microbiome changes in children with epilepsy. So the ketogenic diet is usually an established tool for epilepsy and is much more effective than most drugs. And researchers looked at the microbiome of children before a ketogenic diet and afterwards and they found that before there were a lot of pathogenic or harmful bacteria found in the microbiome, which were completely gone or reduced after a ketogenic diet. Let's be honest, even a ketogenic diet that includes a lot of vegetables is rather low in fiber compared to a high carb diet. But before we discuss whether this is a good or bad thing, I want to clarify one thing here really quick. Several studies show that not all fiber is created equal. So even though you're eating a lot of fiber, it doesn't mean that you feed the right microbes or that you feed them at all. Another thing I want to clarify is also that microbes can live on different energy sources. Some prefer fiber, others prefer simple carbohydrates and sugar, and again others proteins or fat. We don't know so much about the fat-loving microbes yet, and most of what we know comes from studies that use a diet that is high in fat, but also high in sugar. So nothing like a ketogenic diet. Therefore, I would take another approach here and talk about things we actually know. We know that one of the main reasons why fiber is considered as healthy is that it is converted in the column to short-chain fatty acids. 
And as I mentioned already, short-chain fatty acids are very beneficial molecules as they provide an energy source to our gut lining cells and also communicate with our immune system. Especially butyrate seems to be the short-chain fatty acid that provides the most health benefits. And this table here gives a brief overview about the health benefits of butyrate such as improving the gut lining and inflammation control. Now the ketone body beta-hydroxybutyrate has a very similar structure to butyrate with just one additional hydroxyl group. Now to be fair, small molecular changes can make a hell of a difference in biochemistry. However, this review here describes that there is a lot of similarity between beta-hydroxybutyrate and butyrate. It describes that butyric acid and beta-hydroxybutyrate are signaling ligands for various receptors involved in neuroinflammation control. So in other words, both molecules activate the same pathways, especially when it comes down to the immune system. A good example here is our master regulator for oxidative stress, the NRF2 transcription factor, which regulates the expression of antioxidant proteins. Studies show that a ketogenic diet can activate the NRF2 pathway. Butyrate has also been shown to activate it, so again we have an overlap here. And both molecules also seem to act as a histone deacetylase inhibitor, which is for instance important for the prevention of cancer development, but also many other things. Dr. Jeff Forlake, who is a professor at Ohio State University, speculates about the role of fiber on a ketogenic diet here. Uh, so it's provocative to me to think though that a ketogenic diet um, which results in increases in hepatically derived beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is very similar chemically, structurally, to butyrate, it just has a hydroxyl group, um, could serve as an alternative source of butyrate for the colonocytes. And in fact, there is some animal uh, research to support this, this may be the case. But in that sense, um, you know, you could say that a high carbohydrate diet increases your requirement for fiber because you're inhibiting your own body's production of ketones and that a ketogenic diet decreases your requirement for fiber because you're already supplying that butyrate. Okay, I hope this video clarifies why a ketogenic diet might in the end be good for your gut health. I personally, however, like to have my fiber high on a ketogenic diet as it kind of makes me feel better and it keeps me full longer. But I know also of other people who have to go lower on their fiber intake as it reduces their bloating or other issues. Again, consider subscribing if you found this video helpful and also please consider giving me a like for this video since I put a lot of work in it. Thank you for watching and see you next time. I know that I like